Bible and study your Bible and, and, you, and your kids and grandkids around you, what you're telling them, that's optional. Amen? If you never do anything that a Christian is supposed to do, you're telling those around you that you influence that those are optional. And we know from Scripture, obeying God is not optional. Because it comes with consequences when we do not follow. If we just unpack so Solomon's life, if we just follow Solomon's life and learn uh, the key uh, components of his life and apply it to our lives, you and I would be better off. Because we would look at what he did and we would do the opposite of what he did. Amen? So here's the question I have for you based on these verses. So, so that Solomon would be a successful king, what advice did David give Solomon? Amen. Some of you all have children that are either in college or headed to college. Maybe they were in middle school and they just started high school. All right. And maybe they're going off to school for the first time. I'm sure you sat that child down and gave them some wise counsel. Amen. You gave them some wisdom. You gave them some guidance. Uh, some of us that come from African-American culture that parents had to tell us how to interact with police and what not to do and things and not to get ourselves in trouble when you get pulled over by the police and give you some wise counsel because you start bumping your gums and acting a fool and you act your fool in front of that person, you might find yourself in jail and I'm not coming to get you no time soon. Are y'all with me? Because we're just trying to impart to you some wise counsel. All of us need wise counsel because none of us have all the answers for life. Amen. Which is why we seek wise counsel, which is why we put, we uh, uh, welcome the people that God puts in our path that helps us with that wise counsel. The problem with congregational members is they make a decision without wise counsel. And then they go and tell the pastor what they're going to do. Didn't solicit any prayer, didn't ask the church to pray for them, but they make this wholehearted decision that, that, trans, uh, that has a profound impact on the whole family. I don't care if your decision is big or small. Find someone while you're trying to marinate the, that around in your brain that you would go to someone and say, look, you know, I'm thinking about this. Uh, uh, I just want to know what you think. So, I mean, somebody that's trustworthy, not a yes man or yes woman, somebody going to give you God's honest opinion or guidance about a situation. But the problem is you don't want to go to that person because you've already made up your mind and you don't want them to talk you out of it. See, David understood how difficult it was that he, that for him that when he was the king of Israel all those years and the mistakes that he made. And he wants his son to succeed because he knows the daunting task that's upon him. Amen? So again, so that his son would be a successful king, what advice did David give Solomon? He gave him three pieces of advice that's found in these four verses. And they relate to us as well. Amen? Verse 1 says, as David time drew near, uh, to die drew near, that means that David was on his deathbed. That means that David was about to die at any time. It was customary in those days when the patriarchs and, 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 and kings and people in those high positions, when they were passing on, they would often take the time uh, to pray for their offspring and also give them some divine guidance. Because they won't be around anymore. David knew his time was drawing near. He knew that he was going to die. So he was not going to be there anymore to give, give his son any more advice. So he gave him the best advice he could give him. The first thing he tells him in this text is that he says, be strong. He told him, be strong. He says, I am going the way of the earth, so be strong. Again, going away the earth means that he will die very soon. Be strong depends on God's supernatural strength and not your own physical strength. You and I get tired. These physical bodies we have wear out. Amen. But the supernatural power of God will give you the ability to go on even when you don't feel like going on. Amen. Some of y'all here today only because the Holy Spirit brought you this way because you didn't feel like it. Some of y'all are tuning in right now because the Holy Spirit led you because you didn't feel like it. Amen. 
So let me give you an example of what it means to be strong. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 13, through 13, it talks about the armor of God. And it tells us how to be strong. All right. So this is a New Testament explanation of what an Old Testament principle was talking about. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord. So why does he say, finally, be strong in the Lord? Because he understands. Paul understood when he's talking to the church of Ephesus, to these Ephesian Christians, he understood you can't be strong by yourself. He said, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, or some translations say the power of his might. Then he says, put on, which is, it denotes a sense of urgency. In the Greek context, it means to put it on to keep it on. It means put it on now and to keep it on. The full arm of God. The problem with us is that we have dress when we come to worship. We have dress when we leave the house. Not physically have dress, but spiritually have dress because we don't put on the full armor of God. And we wonder why we keep taking all these blows from Satan, all of these headaches from Satan, all this manipulation from Satan, because we walk around not equipped, not wearing this full armor. He said, you put it on so you be able to do what? To stand. Then he says, stand firm against the schemes of who? The devil. The devil's scheming against me and you right now. And he's trying to get after me and you right now. But thank God for the hedge of protection that God puts around a faithful believer. Remember Job, when, when Satan was trying to get to Job? And Satan had a conversation with God and he said, look, the only why he, reason why he worships you and he's, that he, he's, he's allegiant to you and and he does all and he honors you is because you've hedged him about and you give him everything. In other words, you, he, you, you bought his allegiance. He said, because I've been trying to get to him. He said, but you fenced him in. He said, you move your hand. I make him curse you to your face. So that lets us know if anything is hitting us and God is allowing to hit us. There's a reason behind that. Amen. There's a reason behind that. And some of it is self-inflicted because we just won't put on the full armor. Amen. He said, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. This word struggle in Greek context means hand-to-hand combat, up close and personal. So I struggle. Us wrestling. See, the problem is, is that Satan manipulates one of us to get to the other one of us. In other words, Satan would manipulate, uh, manipulate a family. To cause one person in the family to be against the other person in the family. Yeah. Because he says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Well, flesh and blood is human beings. So you're not wrestling. It's not against black and white that we wrestle. It's the fact that Satan has inserted himself in the race relations with people all over the globe. Yeah. Yeah. And what the problem is, we're not discerning enough to see it, to understand. We're not black people, not against white people. And white people not get Hispanic people and Hispanic people not get Asian people and so on and so forth. But Satan is manipulating people based on racial ethnicity. And we fall for it. Because he tells us it, so that we are able to stand firm against the scheme of the devil for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual force of wickedness in heavenly place. In other words, Satan and all of his entourage. That's who all those, uh, all, all those things are and forces I just read. Then there's a therefore. He said, therefore, take up, which is another imperative, a command, the full arm of God so that you can do what? That you will be able to resist on the evil day. Well, today might have been that day. Uh, Amen. Uh, I think. About a week ago, I think he shared in time when he was leading us in prayer. Reverend Russell, his evil day was his job calling him. When you ain't been in here seven months, you're terminated. The devil is a liar. Because his job couldn't terminate him unless God allowed it. And he probably was saying, good, I was ready to walk away from y'all anyway. (laughs) 
But if God terminated it, that means God has something else. But we don't ever look at it like that, do we? Because God doesn't allow one door to close without opening another. And if that door closed, that means that chapter in your life is time to move on. He has something better. He has something different for you. And at the, from then on, you say, okay, God, I get it. Then what's next for me? Give me the strength and the ability to handle what you're walking me through each and every day. Amen. So the second point, so that his son would be able to be a successful king, what advice uh, did David give Solomon? He told him the second thing he told him, it'd be a godly leader. Amen. First, he told him to be strong. And the inference is what I just read you from, uh, from Ephesians chapter 6. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, not your might, but in his might. Amen. So that you and I will be able to resist in the evil day. Satan is not going to change his tactics on you if what he's using against you is working. Amen. You see it often in, in sports. You, if, a, if a team is running a play and you can't stop it, why would they change plays? You see it all, all the time where a team uh, run, has two or 300 yards rushing against a team. You know that's a lot of yards, right? You know the field is only 100 uh, yards long. And by the time they get the ball, they're already on the 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or something like that. So that means they ran up and down the field on you. That means your, your defense was like butter. It had no resistance. It had no resistance at all. But why would they stop running that play if it keeps working? Well, Satan works off that same principle. If what he is doing to you and know that you got an attitude problem, he's going to keep agitating you in your attitude just so you can act out of character. Amen. So instead of you having peace and joy, you frustrated all the time. You mad all the time. And don't let them people be giving surveys call you. <laughs> don't let them call get on get you on the phone. It ain't going to be pretty. Amen. But nobody should be able to manipulate you into ruining your day. I don't care who they are. Because if you woke up with the, in the right frame of mind, trusting in the Lord, no matter what news or what somebody else is throwing at you or trying to do to you, then you just step back, exhale, and say, you know, God's got this. God's got this. And then you always got to consider the source. Amen. So he tells him the second point of how to be a successful king is be a godly leader. Because here's how he says it. He says, therefore, show yourself or prove yourself a man. Why would, now you got to understand, when, when Solomon took over, Solomon was 40 years old. Solomon was 40 years old when he took over his king. So why would David tell his son Solomon this advice? Because there had to be something in Solomon's character that, for David to tell him to be a man. Prove yourself a man. In other words, perhaps David sensed some, some weakness in Solomon. Perhaps he knew Solomon would be tested in the greater ways than before. Whatever the exact reason was, David knew Solomon needed strength and courage or prove yourself as a man. Great responsibilities require great strength and courage. Amen. If you're married, guess what? You have great responsibility. If you're a parent, you have great responsibility. If you have a job, you have great responsibility. If you're enrolled in school, you have great responsibility. Even if you retire, in God's eyes, you still have great responsibility. But he might say, well, pastor, I retired. I'm not supposed to do nothing. Well, that's what you say. That's not what God says. Because God said, now I'm giving you more time to do what I want you to do. You mean, God, I wouldn't retire to sleep and just watch TV all day, you know, I, uh, just eat up, get up when I eat when I want to and all of that? No. No. It's so that you could be a vessel God can use, even on a greater level. Let me give you an example of what it means to be a godly leader. In Genesis 17, verse 1 through 4, it deals with Abram and the covenant of circumcision. And it tells us how to be a godly leader. It says that now when Abraham 
This is Genesis 17, verse 1. Now, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. In other words, I am El Shaddai. I am El Shaddai. He says, walk before me and be blameless. What did God promise at this point in, in, in time in Scripture, in chapter 17, what did God promise Abraham chapters way back? He promised him a son. Did he not? Abraham did not get the full vision of what God had, was trying to tell him because Abraham thought this, that Eliezer would be his son in that sense. Because Eliezer was the chief servant of Abraham at the time and he was very close to him and he treated him like a son. And he told him no. And so he thought that Ishmael would be the one. Because remember, Sarah and Abraham couldn't wait till God revealed, till God moved. So they decided to concoct the plan uh, where they followed the custom in that day, which allowed, because if a man didn't have a child by, his, by his, his legal wife, he could actually take on another wife in order to bear a child. And that's where Hagar comes in. But God allowed it, but that was not God's chosen so now, because remember, it was 24 years earlier. 24 years earlier, God made him that promise. You find that in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, when he pulls him out of the Ur Chaldean, he's a pagan. He's, he's not a worshiper of God. And God pulls him out and told him that, hey, obey me, and I'm going to do something brand new with you. I make your father many nations. Amen. So at 99 years old, right when God is on the cusp of fulfilling that promise, 24 years, how long are you willing to wait on God? See, we are so instant in what we do that if God don't move now, I'm going to move on my own. If God don't move by next week, boy, I'm telling you. <laughs> if, if God don't move by Monday, I'm taking matters in my own hands. That's how we act and react. But when God makes you a promise, wait on the promise. Amen. That's why you got to know the word of God, because the word of God is full of God's promises. The reason why so many of us don't know, because we're ignorant of those promises. We just don't know. Bible reading and study is not our thing. It doesn't mean you don't know any scripture, but you don't know enough scripture. And it's when you are committed to understanding and growing spiritually by knowing and doing the word of God, so you can do the will of God. Amen? He says, I am God Almighty. When he says walk before me, that word walk is not talk, taking a stroll. That's, that's not the limited, that's the limited sense of what that means. He's talking about his lifestyle. Often when this word is used, whether Hebrew or Greek, the uh, word walk is when it's, you use it in this context, it's talking about his lifestyle. Live before me. In other words, live in a way as I observe your life in a way that's pleasing and acceptable to me. Because God is always examining my life and your life every day. Everything you and I do, he sees. Everything you and I do, he knows. He even knows before we even do it. Because he's omniscient, God not only can see in the future, he's already existing in the future. Because remember, he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so because of that, there's nothing you and I can go through that God doesn't understand what it is you're going through, even if you don't understand. Amen? So he knows all and he sees all. He knows the very thoughts of our intentions of why we're doing what we do. Now, we can tell each other that this is why I'm doing it. But God knows the very intentions of why you're doing it. Amen? Because you might give a gift to someone, not because you actually care. You might give them a gift just to shut them up. <laughs> That's a difference. That's a big difference. That you, that you give, give someone a gift because you care, and you give them something they can use, opposed to just doing it, I, you feel like I'm obligated. I really don't care how you respond to it. You just better be glad I did it. Well, that's the wrong motives. 
Amen. He said, I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, see, when he fell on his face, that's a sign of worship. He said, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and with, will be and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. Now, he's 99 years old. And God is once again reminding him that he's going to be the father of many nations. Well, how can you be the father of many nations without a child? That's a biblical impossibility. And if God told him that, then God's going to have to provide him a child. And notice that God waited till, till when Abraham turned 100 years old and Isaac was born. Oh, did I not tell you that uh, Sarah was 10 years his junior? When he's 99, Sarah's 89. Well, even now, 89 and, 90, and 99 people don't, year old people don't birth children. This was a, a special revelation of God. Yeah, they had to wait that long, but it was sweeter. Because even though they had him in his old age, she had him in her old age because of the promise that God had made. And he told him, he's basically telling Abraham, because what I'm calling you to do, I got to develop you into a godly leader. Amen. Amen. Because even after he waited all this time, you say, why did he wait 25 years? Because God had to prepare him to be that father. See, if he'd, if he'd have made him that father 25 years earlier, then God doesn't get out of Abraham what he needed out of Abraham. Or are you getting it? This is why sometimes God will delay with me and you. Because if he gives it to us too early, we mess it all up. If he gives it to us too early, we would not be able to handle what it is he's actually given us. Amen. That's why you don't take a person who just got saved and make them the pastor of the church. That's why you don't take a person who just got saved and get them to lead the Bible study. Amen. That's why you don't do those types of things. Because what happens is you're setting yourself up for failure if you try to do those things before you're ready for those things. And you often see it when people have, have children, especially children out of wedlock. When they have children at the wrong interval. And it's not that God would not have blessed them with children. They're just not ready to handle and they struggle. They struggle financially. It's like two people, nobody got a job and say, we love each other, we get married. Well, where y'all gonna live? With mama and them. <laughs> We're going to live with auntie. You know how people do. Well, if you, if you don't have the resources to take care of yourself, then you should not be getting married. It's simple. Because you're going to struggle. What you do is you don't put the cart before the horse. You prepare for that. You know how it was in Jewish culture? When a man wanted to get married in Jewish culture, he had to go to the father and convince the father that he was a good catch. How many of y'all would still be married? <laughs> I ain't trying to meddle in your business or nothing. I'm just asking a question here. Would you still be married? If at the time that you did get married, you had to go and convince that father-in-law. He probably would say no because you didn't have no money. You didn't have good sense. You just crazy in love, I guess, with his daughter. It didn't work that way because what they would have is they would have a betrothal period which normally lasts about a year. And what you would do is that once you convince that father that you could do that, you could handle that responsibility because that father did not want to have to take care of that daughter again. Not in that sense. Because once she left, and she got married, she, he, he wanted to make sure that that husband would provide, which is what's his responsibility. So in Jewish culture, you would go off and get a house. You go out and, and get the furnishing for the house. Now, some of y'all might like, not like this. You say, boy, my husband got bad taste. 
I would never want him to be decorating our house. But that's how it was in that culture. Not only that, when she got there, the food was there. The furniture was there. Amen. All the things to, 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 to have a home was already there. We don't do that. Most of us are broke when we get married, right? <laughs> but we learn how to grow into that relationship. We learn how to do what that song said, first things first. Amen. We learn how to do what's necessary, first things first. Because with privileges become responsibility. It's a privilege and a blessing to be married. Just like it's a privilege and a blessing to be a father, to be a mother. But with those privileges becomes responsibility. Amen. So he told them that my covenant is with you. A covenant is a contract or agreement, binding. God signed that covenant contract. That means no man could ever break it. Amen. Are y'all getting this? So the third point. That asks the question or answers the question so that his son will be a successful king. What advice did David give Solomon? He told him to obey God completely. Once again, he told him to be strong. Basically telling him, be strong in the power, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. The second thing he told him was to be a godly leader. And how do you become a godly leader? Is you put God first. How do you be strong? You put God first. How do you obey God completely? This third point, you have to put God first. Look what he says in verse 3 and 4. Of 1 Kings 2, he said, do your duty to the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinance and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses. To walk in his ways means to live a lifestyle that lines up with scripture. To keep his statutes means to obey God's laws or principles. To keep his commandments means to obey God's orders, directives and instructions. To keep his ordinances means to obey God's regulations and rules. To keep his testimonies means to obey God's public acknowledgments and declarations. And there, if you do these things, there's a result if you're doing it the right way. There's a result clause here because he says, so that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn. Did y'all get that? First, he tells them once again, do your duty to the Lord, your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinance, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, so that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn. How many of y'all want to succeed? All of us should want to succeed. But the only way you're going to succeed in a way that's meaningful to God, that matters to God anyway, is that you have to put God's first. You have to obey his word, his command. But you say, well, pastor, I don't know what he's commanded. Then how can you follow? It? If you never avail yourself to learn the word of God, to be taught correctly the word of God, then you'll never be able to live the word of God. You'll struggle in your Christian walk, which is why many Christians struggle. And eventually they just give up. That's why you find many people that they don't, they don't, they won't attend church. They won't go to Bible study. They don't do any of that stuff because they didn't do it God's way. You've heard people say, I tried church, that didn't work for me. I tried reading the Bible, that didn't work for me. I tried praying, that didn't work for me. You know why they say that? Because they tried God on their terms and not his. Anytime you try God on your terms, it'll never work. Because God only, only works when you try him on his terms. Amen. He said, and keep the charge of the Lord, your God. David also knew that Solomon could not be strong or courageous without obedient fellowship with God. In this place of obedient fellowship, Solomon would prosper in all that he did. Verse four says, so that uh, another 
clause, a result clause, he says, so that the Lord may fulfill his promise, which he spoke regarding me, saying, if your sons are careful about their walk to walk before me in truth with all their heart and all their soul, you shall not be deprived of a man to occupy the throne of Israel. Amen. That was a promise God kept. Amen. And the reason why we know that, because Jesus Christ was born into this world. Amen. God kept that promise. Because Jesus Christ was born in the lineage of David. Amen. When he says your sons, the Hebrew terminology used here can refer to David's 17 sons or to all the descendants in the context. The broader meaning is probably in intended. Walk before me in truth means live a, live a life that reflects God's glory. With all heart and soul, be totally committed in every possible way. You shall not be deprived of a man to occupy the throne of Israel. In other words, your obedience will lead to the success of your offspring. That the Lord may fulfill his word with, uh, which he spoke concerning me. David had a general reason to exhort Solomon's obedience, but he also had a specific reason, a specific promise to God. God promised David that as long as his sons walked in obedience, they would keep the throne of Israel. You shall not be deprived of a man to occupy the throne of Israel. This was an amazing promise. No matter what the Assyrians or the Egyptians or Babylonians did, which are uh, nations that, that conquered uh, God's people along the way, Israel, as long as David's sons were obedient and followed God with all their heart, with all their soul, God would establish their kingdom. He would take care of the rest. We may envy the sons of David because they, they had such a promise, but we have a similar promise from God. When Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all this righteousness and everything we need, we add it on to us. God, God promises that if we put him first, there's that phrase again, first things first, he will take care of the rest. In other words, as I often say, obey God and leave all the consequences to him. The third and final example of this particular principle is God's instruction to Joshua. And Joshua chapter 1 tells us how to completely obey God. Could you imagine being Joshua? Joshua succeeded Moses. Who was Moses? Moses one of the giants in the scripture. And Joshua had been there much of his life as assistant to Moses, and he watched Moses and what Moses went through in leading two million grumbling, mumbling, complaining people. And you thought you had problems with just a few people in your house to be complaining. Could you, be, could you imagine being responsible for shepherding two million people that constantly complained? They were angry with God and they took it out on you. They didn't understand God, so they took it out on you. They didn't want to be faithful to God, so they took it. Could you mind, imagine being Moses? Now, Moses is now dead. And Joshua is God's appointed successor to Moses. So he has to give him some encouragement because of the daunting task that is before him. See, Moses failed. You didn't know Moses failed. Moses failed because what Moses did, God did not allow him to take the people into the promised land. He only could get him to the edge. And it was Joshua's job to take them over, to cross over. Amen? So what God would have done with Moses alone, but Moses didn't do what Moses was supposed to do because what Moses did, remember he struck the rock. He got so frustrated with the people and God told him to put, the, uh, put his staff toward the rock. But Moses struck the rock. And God said, for that, you won't get in the promised land. That didn't mean that Moses wouldn't save and you won't find him in heaven. That's not what that means. Don't get it twisted. What it meant, because Moses got so frustrated, he said, shall I bring forth water from this rock? Moses had never brought forth water from the rock. God always did. But Moses had to follow the instructions to the T. Amen. So when he struck the rock twice, the inference was that Jesus Christ would have to be struck twice. That would mean Jesus Christ would have to die twice on Calvary or some other hill. But Jesus Christ was not going back to Calvary. Amen. Only once to pay the penalty for our sins. So 
Verse 8 and 9. Answers this question, tell us how to completely obey God. He says, keep this book of the law. Always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful. There's that condition clause again. So that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. In other words, he basically tells him, obey the Bible. Read it, study it, learn it, apply it daily. If you do that, that's what it means to meditate on day and night. In other words, good times, bad times. You find the time to have quiet time with God through scripture. He said, if you do that, he said, then you will be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The reason why some of us are not prosperous and successful, we don't obey God. We can be successful in man's terms. There are a lot of people that in the world scheme of things, we say they're successful. But those same people you won't find in heaven. So what's your definition of success? Amen. What's your def- how you define success? Do you find it the world's way? Based on how much money you earn, how many titles you have in your name, how many degrees you, you, you earn, how big your 401k is, how fat your wallet is, how fat your purse is. Is that how you decide, define success? How expensive your clothes are? Well, that's not how the Bible describes success. Not God's way. Because you can have all those things and still be on your way to hell. Amen? But God's way of success is when we yield ourselves to his will. Then he makes us successful. Amen. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you would live in the most expensive house on the street necessarily. If God needs you to, then he will make you that. Because whatever you need to have in order to do his will, God has to provide it for you. Amen. Then he says again in verse 9, He says, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? He said, be afraid. Do not be discouraged or do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. In other words, if you be strong and courageous in his might, I don't have to fear or walk in fear. Amen. I don't have to be afraid. Because it doesn't matter what the world throws at me. I don't have to be afraid because I get a bad doctor's report. I don't have to be afraid because somebody terminates my job. I don't have to be afraid when I get the pink slip. When I get the bill saying my mortgage is overdue, I don't have to be afraid. All I got to do is talk to God about it. Amen. Because God already knows what you're facing. Because he said, but the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's the good news. I don't care how bad your day is going. God's right there with you. I don't care how bad you're feeling. God is right there with you. Amen. Because your job couldn't have terminated you without God signing off on it. That person couldn't treat you that way unless God signed off on it. You wouldn't be where you are if God didn't sign off on it because the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Amen. Because so there's some valuable lessons that each of us should learn from this text. You don't have to be a king of a country in order for these principles to apply to you. Amen. You don't have to be a leader of a church. You don't have to be any of those things. All you have to do is be you trying to make it through life for the glory of Christ. And then you can follow these simple principles of being strong in the Lord and the power of his might. When he says be a good leader, you say, well, pastor, I'm not a leader. I beg the difference. Because each of us, God uses us to lead in some way, form, or fashion. Because leadership is the ability to pack things to make have results. You might not be a senior leader. But in God's own way, he uses you to provide leadership. But see, we think the leader is only the one who's at the top. 
but he'll use you to lead, to take the lead in the situation. And he'll use your gifts and abilities he's given you to bring that to pass, to empower you through his spirit to be successful for your good and for his glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. If you're here today or you're online, listen to this message today. I don't know where your struggles are. We all have them. We all get frustrated. We all get bent out of shape. Our family members get on our nerves. All of us, we're, 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 we're not immune to any of that. It comes with just living life. Amen. But are you going to turn to God when the frustration rises? Are you going to turn to him and say, God, I don't understand. But all I ask is you give me the strength to handle what you're walking me through. Lord, I can't see right now what you need me to see, so I ask you to open up my eyes so I can see. Lord, I have some faith, and you know that. I have some belief, and you know that. But Lord, help me in my unbelief. Isn't that what the man prayed? Help me while I struggle, oh God. So that I have to be stuck all the time. That I may honor you with my whole life. And start of letting the world get to me. And every, all the craziness that's going on around me. Lord, I trust that you give me the peace and the joy and the hope that comes with being a child of the Most High God. If you and I learn how to put things in his hands instead of trying to get up and run with it in our hands. His ability is so much better than our ability. But he will strengthen us by surrendering our will for his will. Let us pray together, shall we? Turn to God our Father. We bow before you now, O God, thanking you for another blessed day. A brand new day was not promised to us, O God. We just pray for all those under the sound of my voice. Lord, there's someone here today that's struggling with a situation or circumstance. And it's a hurtful circumstance because they don't have the answer. And they don't know what to do. The bills may still be piling up. The job may be terminated. They may have some health issues. Or whatever they may be. They may have relationship issues with someone they care about a lot. Someone they love. And they can't seem... They have any peace in the midst of their storm. Lord, I pray now that you would touch them in a special way. Whether they're present with us or online with us, I pray now that no matter what their situation or circumstances may be, your issue may not be money trouble, but trouble is trouble nonetheless. And Father, I pray to God that you give us peace that surpasses all understanding. And maybe you just need to give your life to Christ right now. Or maybe even recommit, recommit your life to Christ. Only you know where you stand with God. So I would encourage you to stop playing with God. And be faithful to him in, in all things and all ways. In other words, the song say, first things first. If you believe that in your heart and you want to pray today and Give everything to him once again. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I admit that I've sinned. I admit that I'm a sinner. Today, I want to be restored. Today, I want to know that I know that I know that I'm going to be with you in glory when I pass this earth. But Lord, I want to walk with you each and every day. So Lord, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, past, present, and future. You told us in your word, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised you from the dead, we shall be saved. Lord, right now I confess faith in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I ask, O oh God, and I invite you into my life and my heart, O oh God, that you come in and take control. Give me peace once again that surpasses all understanding. Strengthen me now, O oh God, that I may do your will. I pray that you train me and Give me the strength and the ability to make myself available to you that I may be taught the word of God. 
that I may be discipled, that I may train in a way that I would know you and know your will. And I would surround myself with other believers, oh God, that I don't have to walk this journey alone. Lord, I thank you, oh God, for saving me. I give you my all, and I bless and honor your name. And pray, perhaps you're here today, and there's other troubles in your life, and you've already saved, but there's something else that's overwhelming you in your life. Maybe it's your health, maybe it's your strength, maybe it's family situations, maybe it's relationships, maybe it's your job, your career, maybe it's school. Just pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm just overwhelmed. Sometimes I'm just so easy, frustrated, irritated. And this situation really has been weighing me down. So you can talk to God right now about whatever that situation is, or that circumstance is. And you can give it to him right now. You can cast all your cares and concerns upon him because the word of God says he cares for us. So now I ask you to give it to him. Whatever the burden is, give it to him. And trust him for the answer. Trust him for the deliverance. Trust him for the resources you need to do his will, whatever they may be. Trust him for whatever you're lacking and just ask him to fill you up where you're empty. Strengthen you where you're weak. Bless you in a powerful and mighty way. For our good and for his glory, we pray. And all of God's people said in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.
am reliable. Must I am ready? Yeah, I will follow. Follow you till the end of time. Let's follow. your testimony today. Amen. Go ahead and give him praise. Give him your hand clap of praise. I hope that is your testimony that I will follow him until the end of time. When the road gets difficult, when it gets tough, just remember you don't have to walk this journey by yourself. Amen. Just a couple of announcements before we have our benediction. The uh, Sister Brandy, her grandfather passed. And the funeral service is in Nakona, Texas. It's about 140 miles from here. So that's going to be Tuesday to 12 noon. And so those who like to go with us, there's a few of us are going to go 9 a.m. We'll leave and head out there. We're about 9 a.m. Uh, to, to, to support uh, the Sparks family for that. It's at Bethel Baptist Church in Nakona, Texas. And so we've been up there before uh, when her dad passed and her grandmother passed because the funerals were there. So that's Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. And so uh, the other announcement is on Saturday, uh, the I believe it's the 23rd, we're going to have outreach. Remember, we had Dr. Baker came and he did our training for us to do evangelism. And so we hadn't been out in months and months uh, because it's been hot and so now it's a little cooler we're going to head out we're going to meet here at the church at 2 p.m. so if you'd like to join us uh, we meet here at 2 p.m. on Saturday for that and I think that's uh, the other thing is in October I think we are scheduled for the 14th or the 21st which is our annual picnic and so you'll get more information about that uh, coming up and so we are uh, thankful to God for all that he does in our lives, we praise him with the highest praise. He's been good to all of us, has he not? And we thank God for each of you. We're still praying. There are, our, our prayer list is full. And so let's continue to pray for those on our prayer list as we continue to pray for one another. Amen. If you've been blessed by today's message, you've been tuning in, you can go to our website at agapecommunityfellowship.org and you can donate there. And there's different ways you can donate uh, that it tells you you can give to the ministry at Agape. And we thank you, uh, those of, uh, who, who give tremendously to Agape, and we're going to encourage you to continue to do that. Also, you can go and you can listen to the messages from the uh, previous messages and go to our website and get the links, and you can listen to them uh, in their entirety, the messages from not only today, but past Sundays. And so we invite you to stand at this time as we dismiss. We thank God for each of you. We pray that you just have a blessed and wonderful week. We hope to see you on Wednesday. We're going to do a deeper dive into our message today. Uh, that we went over today for Wednesday at 7. And so we hope to see each of you uh, that will join us for that. Amen. And also, once again, we'd love to have you in Sunday school with us. You miss a great time. Uh, we have Sunday school books that we're going through the book of Mark right now. 
And so you need a copy of the book uh, that you get before you leave today. Amen. Receive your benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May he always make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May nothing you face in life be anything you or God cannot handle. May you go forth today under the anointing and blessing of God. No matter what you're lacking, may God not only meet it, but exceed in your life. May he give you the strength to handle what you're walking through each and every day. And may he fill you and bless you with his divine peace and cover you with his amazing anointed blood. Until God, until we meet again, may God watch between me and you as I pray. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Yeah.